Well, good evening and welcome to Chapter 7. Uh, we are still laying the groundwork here for uh, defenses. We're going to shift to some of the other defenses uh, to talk about. And uh, we got quite a few. Uh, they're very buried in this chapter. Uh, that's why I guess they put it as a kind of a catch-all other criminal defenses. Again, it's going to start off with uh, our learning objectives. Um, these are not um, necessary for you to know as you go through and watch this lecture. I think they're, again, helpful. Uh, you're probably sick of hearing that, but um, they'll help you understand some of the major points I'm making. But again, if you want to skip over these, that's fine. We'll just let you go back and review them if you want. Okay, so the first broad thing we're going to talk about, and then we'll go into individually some of these, is we're going to look at some affirmative defenses. Um, so, usually, um, when you are trying to prove the elements of the crime, the corpus delecti, the bottom of the, the body of the crime, the prosecution has uh, the burden of proof. They have to come forward and prove every element of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, sometimes that's very easy. Sometimes it's a little difficult when it comes to a particular element. So let's take, for example, the crime of first-degree burglary in North Carolina. If you were to look at those elements, um, if we were to break them down, it would be you break, you enter an occupied dwelling at night with intent to commit a felony therein. That's a burglary charge. Now, you notice that one of those elements was at night because we have a different charge in North Carolina if the break-in occurs during the day. Now, obviously, proving whether it's day or night is very simple. So some parts of proving the burglary are very easy. Yeah, you, you prove that the burglary occurred at night. Now, you're going to have to prove that your suspect or your defendant actually committed the breaking and the entering, but proving that it's nighttime, that's relatively easy. When we talk broadly about uh, affirmative defenses, we can say that there are two major categories, either an excuse defense or justification defense. Um, and, and generally, these affirmative defenses will admit to the commission of the act. Your book says commission of the crime. I would say commission of the act sometimes. But demonstrate that there is an acceptable defense. Um, so m many of these are just unrelated to what the general public would think of as guilt or innocence. Okay, so what are some of the affirmative defenses that we could talk about? Well, there are the defenses that bar prosecution. Uh, these would be immunity defenses, double jeopardy offenses, statute limitations. These are usually related to um, issues of constitutionality uh, or process. Um, then there are defenses that relate to one of the elements of the defense um, or, or the guilty mind sometimes um, that if you can prove, negate, or throws out one element of the offense. So if I took someone's property, I suppose we're talking about a larceny here, if I took someone's property and I believe that property was mine, you might be able to establish that I took the property uh, that it, you know it fit the definition of a theft. But if I could show, well, what I took was a briefcase that looked exactly like my briefcase, and it even had the same initials on it, and it was the same color, and it was the same size and shape, and I was just leaving the room, and I grabbed it, and it wasn't an intent to steal then you could say that you have negated, really, in that case, um, the intent to commit the act. Because remember, you've got the physical acts and the mens rea. Then there's going to be some defenses that are called justification defenses, which really shows that you did the act, but you have a justification for it. And the big one here is self-defense. Yes, I struck the defendant, which otherwise might be an assault or, under the common law, an assault and a battery but I did it in self-defense. Um, and of course, then there are defenses that we admit exist, but we say there is an excuse for them. 
And these are going to be things like insanity, uh, duress, and coercion. We'll, we'll get to each of these, and as we get through these, I think they'll become a little bit clearer for you. Okay, so let's talk about the first one, and that's immunity. Now, there are uh, different types of immunity. Your, your text at least briefly mentions diplomatic immunity. That's not something that you're going to see much at all. Um, you will sometimes see legislative immunity. Uh, that's a little bit more common. And then by far the largest one will be witness immunity. And that's actually got different components to it. But let's just deal with the first two that are pretty rare. Diplomatic immunity says that Assuming we have diplomatic relations with a foreign country and that one of their diplomats is present in the U.S., then they cannot be charged. Um, so if the ambassador to France supposedly killed someone in, uh, in Raleigh, um, you could not charge him. He is immune to a criminal charge. Now, France can decide to waive that. France can say, oh, well, you know, this is unrelated to being the ambassador. We're going to waive it. You can have a trial. Legislative immunity. Now, this is something that you might see more commonly in North Carolina. Now, obviously, in, in North Carolina, we don't have a lot of ambassadors. But we do have a lot of legislatures in Raleigh. So, in some cases, uh, senators, representative states, legislators, while their legislative body is in session, going to or returning from, they often can't be served with criminal process or charged. But typically, as soon as their legislative body adjourns, uh, you can charge them. And there actually have been, in my lifetime, a couple of cases where they attempted to give a, a ticket or a summons to a state legislature who is traveling to Raleigh and he raised legislative immunity. It's still pretty rare. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of it. Um, so there is this special on diplomatic immunity. Um, you can take a look at this if, if you like. I think it's an interesting discussion question. I think there's you know some more interesting ones that have, have come up. Um, for example, there is a case of a U.S. diplomat, I believe wife of a diplomat in England, who was involved in a car accident, uh, had diplomatic immunity, came to the United States, came back to the United States. England would like to try her, and the U.S. hasn't waived diplomatic immunity. Okay, so let's talk about what is far, 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 far more common witness immunity. Now, if you're going to be in the criminal justice field, this is something you're going to see. Um, typically, when we talk about witness immunity, um, it can exist at different levels. Um, witness immunity is something that the prosecutor has. So, a prosecutor um, has the power uh, under legislative statute to subpoena someone to appear. In other words, they can bring someone in and say, we want you to talk. But remember, trumping that power, which is a legislative power, a statutory power, is the constitutional power, or constitutional right, rather, of the right in the Fifth Amendment not to be compelled to testify against yourself. And the way that's been interpreted is we say, um, if, if you could possibly be tried for a crime, for anything you might say under prosecutorial questioning, you can claim the fifth, and we can't compel you to talk. So one of the ways that a prosecutor can get around this is they can give you what's sometimes called transactional immunity, which says, all right, whatever you tell us, okay, um, is we will never use what you are saying against you. Sometimes you hear that called, as opposed to transactional, you hear the term testimonial immunity. And what that means is, since I can't use your testimony against you, okay, you have to testify. Now that becomes interesting. There's also total immunity, or blanket immunity. Um, that type of immunity is the best one you can get. So if, if 
if a prosecutor comes to you and says, I'm going to give you complete immunity, usually, usually transactional is its name. If you get complete immunity, then even if I have independent evidence of a crime, I can't charge you. Testimonial immunity says, I won't use your testimony against you, but if I have other evidence, even if you reveal something in your testimony, I can still charge you. That's a pretty fine line. And very often, um, individuals can be hesitant to, uh, to take immunity unless it's that complete transaction or complete, complete immunity. Prosecutors would much prefer, prefer to use use immunity or what I prefer to call testimonial immunity. Okay, um, I'm just going to go ahead and move past that discussion question. It's interesting, but we're going to leave it off for a second. Okay, let's talk about uh, ignorance uh, of fact or mistake as a defense. Um, the general rule here is... There is there is ignorance of the law and ignorance of fact. So, ignorance of law, you didn't know something was illegal, you didn't know what the law was, is, with very few exceptions, not a defense that you can raise. So if you say, well, I didn't know it was against the law for me to... Uh, rake pine straw without the permission of landholder in North Carolina, which in fact it is. North Carolina has some crazy statutes, just like everybody does. Um, if you were raking pine straw and a policeman comes up to you and arrests you and says, well, you didn't have the permission to rake it, you say, well, I didn't know it was against the law. It's not a defense. So the, the, the kind of legal maxim you hear most people say is ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, now, ignorance of law is an excuse, but ignorance of fact can be an excuse. So, if, if you're going to claim that there is some fact that I was unaware of, one of the things we will look at is, whatever crime you're being charged with, is that a crime that requires knowledge, a guilty mind, or is it a strict liability crime? So, that's important because... If we're talking about uh, breaking and entering of a home, if you can show that you didn't realize that the home you're going into wasn't yours, you just move into a neighborhood, the buildings are nearly identical, you're coming home late one night, uh, you put your key in the door, and remarkably enough, your key matches the neighbor's key, and the door opens and you walk in, and you are now in your neighbor's house. Um, <clears throat> you made a reasonable mistake of fact that would be a defense. However, there are some crimes where we don't care what your state of mind was. These are the strict liability crimes we talked about before. So, here's an example in North Carolina. North Carolina statutory rape statute says, did you have sexual relations, actually says vaginal intercourse, did you have vaginal intercourse with someone under now, there's a number of ages in North Carolina that make the crime more or worse, but we'll just use 16 as our, as our number here. So, did you have sexual relations with someone under the age of 16 when you are older than that? Okay, and usually there has to be what's called an age delta, a difference that makes it worse. So, if you're three years older or six years older, it makes it worse. But let's suppose you were 35 and you had sex with someone who was 15. We don't care if you made the mistake that the person you were having sex with was, in fact, of age. It is not a defense. It is a strict liability crime, period, end story. Um, so here's a what-if scenario that you could look at. Timmy meets Jennifer at a party. They exchange phone numbers to go out. He calls her. They go out for dinner. After dinner, they go back to his apartment and have sex. He drops her off. The following day, the police show up and arrest him. He meets with his attorney and he tells her that he didn't know that she was underage. Is he responsible? Well, you know, even, I, and I could change this in North Carolina. I could say that she showed Timmy a fake ID, that they bought liquor in a restaurant and the restaurant carted her. And it said that she was 21, that she was driving a car, that um, she appeared to be emancipated. 
you could show all those things, it still would not be a defense in North Carolina. And you have to ask yourself, should ignorance at some point overcome even a strict liability? And the rule generally is no, it won't. Okay, let's talk about intoxication. Now, there's really two types of intoxication. So, uh, there's voluntary intoxication and involuntary intoxication. So, quickly, we can dismiss involuntary intoxication. If I drug someone and they're unaware of it, that can affect their defense. But let's talk about what happens 99% of the time. People voluntarily either drink alcohol or use drugs. So sometimes people will say, I was so drunk that I didn't know what I was doing. And in almost all cases, that is not a defense. The only time it sometimes can be a defense, and it still almost never works, is if you claim you were so intoxicated that you couldn't form a specific intent to commit an act, that you essentially were rendered non compass mentis, mentally incompetent. That has to be such a high level that it's almost to the point of, well, you shouldn't have been able to do anything. Um, I'm going to say, uh, as an observation here, that voluntary intoxication is sometimes tried as a defense to first-degree murder. Um, but if you raise it as a defense for second degree murder, since there's, or manslaughter in North Carolina, since it's not a, um, specific requirement, a specific intent requirement, it won't operate as a defense. So some people will raise it as first degree to avoid a first degree conviction. I can't recall it working in, in, in my career, ever seeing it. Now I've never done a first degree murder charge. I want to emphasize that, but I've never seen it successful. All right, so let's involuntary intoxication quickly. So, first of all, you're going to have to prove you're involuntarily intoxicated. So you, uh, you're drinking a bottle of Coke. Um, unbeknownst to you, someone has put um, amphetamines in it, or someone has put um, sedatives in it, or someone has put uh, LSD in it. And if that at, at that point. Okay, if you do something and you and you, this would be out of character. You know, you commit an assault or an act, and you say, I, "I didn't know because I didn't know I was taking this drug." The first thing you're going to have to prove for this to be successful is you're going to have to prove that you were involuntarily placed in that state, which can't be easy. Um, so you're going to have to show trick or force then you're going to have to show that you're so badly off from it that it did destroy specific intent. Um, and that you're not physically able of committing the crime. Um, that's going to be difficult. So involuntary intoxication, I, I, I would say that probably the only time it might be useful is I could craft a scenario where I said, I was giving you a drug, a legal drug that you prescribed for, that you had an extremely unusual side effect. Um, so it might have made you sleepwalk, or it might have made you commit some act that otherwise you would never commit. Um, and that that side effect is almost universally on them. That it wasn't, you weren't warned about it, you couldn't reasonably know about it, and you took the drug not knowing of that possible side effect. That might be, I would say, the only likely time you're going to bump into this. And, and there's a discussion uh, about that, and that's uh, interesting, but we'll just move on. Okay, now let's talk about duress and coercion, because there can be different things, and, and, and compulsion as well. When we start to talk about duress, coercion, compulsion, all this, we start to run into the same problem we've run into before, which is um, people tend to use the language casually outside the legal field. But for duress to be duress, 
What it has to be is an immediate physical threat for it to be real duress. So I come up to you, I put a gun against your head, and I say, give me the money from the cash register drawer. You're working as a clerk. All right, well, I've got an immediate physical threat. Uh, it's serious. You can give me the money, and you are not a accessory to the larceny. Um, any threat has to be something that a reasonable person would believe would not resist, it has to be immediate, it has to be physical. So if I come up to you in the grocery store and you're a cash register clerk and I say, give me the money in the cash registry or I will send these uh, naked pictures of you to your wife. If you give me the money, that's not duress, that's not coercion. Okay, I'm actually guilty of another crime, extortion, but since it's not a physical threat, you don't have the defense. All right, necessity. Not something you see for major crimes very much, but you could see it for minor ones. This is way where you say, yes, I committed typically a minor crime um, in order to prevent a greater injury. So the example here is actually a very good one. A driver wrecks his car, walks in the freezing snow to find help for a family member who's trapped, comes on an abandoned house, breaks into the house, no one's home, uses the phone, claims that, well, yes, I broke into the house, um, breaking and entering would be the charge in North Carolina, uh, but I have the defense of necessity. It was necessary to, to do this to save a human life. Now, you can't do this just because you're walking in the snow one day and you're cold. You can't say, well, yeah, I was really cold. I didn't have any place to sleep. I saw this house. I broke in. Otherwise, you know, I could have froze to death, maybe. Not a defense. Uh, not, not, in, not in the United States. Can one kill to save oneself? Um, the general answer here, and I'll let you look at these very old cases, is despite the bad Saw movies that are running around where you see people kill other people to avoid being killed, no, you can't. You cannot kill to save your own life and have it as a defense of necessity. All right, now let's talk about one that um, is an important defense. And, and I almost hesitate to put alibi in with the rest of these, but, but let's, let's talk about that. Um, in alibi defense, what you're claiming is, um, all right, so I'm accused of robbing the Piggly Wiggly in Garner on December 1st at 4 p.m. My defense was on December 1st, I was in Fuquay. I was at the Harris Teeter. Uh, at 4 p.m. I was using my credit card and here's the receipt. So you have an alibi. Now, sometimes you have competing alibis. You know, it's great if you've got physical evidence to establish, but it's it's not unusual at all to say, I couldn't have committed the robbery, I couldn't have committed the assault because I was with my friends and they'll testify that I was with them at another place. Why does alibi work? Well, if the jury is convinced reasonable doubt exists, then remember the, the, the level of proof necessary to convict is beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and the burden is not on me. If it's a tied amount of evidence, then the tie is supposed to go to the defendant. Of course, and this should come as no surprise to you, it certainly never came as a surprise to me as a defense attorney, people lie. So I might say, were you at the Piggly Wiggly at 4 p.m. in Garner? And you might say, no, I wasn't. Um, now, very often, uh, many states have statutes saying you've got to give us notice of an alibi defense before going to trial to give the prosecution time to investigate. This is kind of skirting awful close to trying to get the defendant to waive his Fifth Amendment rights because one of my big advantages as a defense attorney 
is if you have not talked to the prosecution or the police and they have you in custody, they don't know if you have an alibi. They don't know how strong it is. If you've got a really strong alibi, you may want to disclose it because it might lead to a dropping of charges, but you better do it through your attorney. Don't do it through yourself. Um, if the prosecution knows your alibi, of course, they can go out and poke holes in it. So it, it's kind of, you, you might have to roll the dice here. And of course, yes, I can keep what you say that might incriminate you from the prosecution. you got a Fifth Amendment right. And then let you testify at trial as a surprise to the prosecution. But if there is evidence that is associated with it that I need, that's not protected. So let me explain that. If your defense was, well, no, I didn't, um, I wasn't at the, the, the um, Piggly Wiggly and Garner at, on December 1st at 4 p.m. I was at the Harris Teeter in Fuquay. And that's my alibi. And to support my alibi, I want to admit the tape, uh, you know, the closed circuit TV tape from the Harris Teeter. Well, yes, I can keep my testimony, but if I want to admit that tape, I'm going to have to disclose that I'm going to use it at trial. So it's, it's not as absolutely surprise as perhaps it was at one, one point. All right, uh, acting under the authority of another. Um, the general rule is that uh, if you get an order to commit a crime or do something bad, it's not a defense to say you got an order. Uh, even when you're given erroneous information by some uh, individuals. So if, um, if another police officer tells you, hit that guy in the face, and the guy's not resisting, and he's your sergeant, he's your superior, and you hit the guy in the face, it is not a defense to say, well, that was an order from my sergeant. Um, it doesn't give you protection. Double Jeopardy. Now, thanks in part to a terrible movie with Tommy Lee Jones, and I forget who the female lead was. Um, I can picture her, but I can't remember. But in, but in any event, the, the movie Double Jeopardy, if you're ever forced to see it, it's a terrible movie. Um, long story short, a woman is accused of killing her husband. Uh, she's convicted of the crime, serves a number of years in jail, gets let out. Turns out he's alive. It's all part of a scam. She tracks him down. She's getting ready to shoot him. And he goes, you can't shoot me. You'll go to jail. And she says, oh, no, I've already served my time for the crime. I can't go to jail under double jeopardy. That is the wrong interpretation. Okay. What does double jeopardy mean? Okay. Double jeopardy applies if a trial has reached a conclusion. So if a trial acquits you, if you're found not guilty, or if it convicts you, we say that double jeopardy has attached. You cannot be tried again, absent a couple exceptions. So um, this can be important. Obviously, if you're acquitted, you're happy. If you're the defendant and you're acquitted, you're done, you're out of the courtroom, you're dancing. But if you're convicted, you may not be too happy. So, um, what about if the jury doesn't reach a decision? So you, you have a trial for murder, we'll say. Fred's accused of killing Barney. He has a trial. Um, at the end of the trial, the jury comes back and says, can't reach a decision. If the jury is hung, then there's no double jeopardy you can have a retrial. If there is a mistrial, so you're having the trial and a hurricane hits and the courtroom floods and they have to dismiss the case for manifest necessity so you all can get out of Dodge before you drown. Double jeopardy hasn't attached, <coughs> excuse me, you can have another trial. Um, if you have a different or separate offense, we can try you again. You break into a home, you stab someone, 
we have a trial for the burglary. You're found not guilty for the burglary. But later the person you stabbed dies, we can put you on trial for the murder. True, we couldn't convict you of the burglary, but we can convict you of the separate offense of the murder. Now, it also doesn't apply if two separate sovereign entities or governments bring the charges. Example, you kidnap someone in Wilmington, North Carolina, you drive across the border to Charleston, South Carolina. North Carolina could try you for kidnapping. Let's suppose they do, you're found not guilty. Great, double jeopardy attached, but only for North Carolina. Because the crime was also committed in South Carolina, they can try you and you can be convicted. I'll make it even more complex. You kidnap someone in Wilmington, take them to South Carolina, you're arrested in North Carolina, you're found not guilty at trial, South Carolina tries you, you're found not guilty at trial. The federal government decides, because kidnapping across state lines, that they'll charge you. They can still do it. Double jeopardy doesn't attach. Pretty rare, but I've actually seen that a couple times. Um, double jeopardy doesn't apply if the offense charges a separate offense uh, that doesn't require some proof. Um, an example your book gives is kind of weird. If you gave multiple forged checks at the same time and we only charge you with one, um, then fine. Uh, we could charge you for the next one. Um, they're the same if all the facts serve as the same basis for it. So let me give you an example. I stab someone, uh, you charge me with assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury. Okay, you have a trial, I'm found not guilty. Sometime later he dies. Now there's a new element there, okay? Um, you, can, you could try to argue, I suppose, that um, there's a new element because of the death but basically under res judicata, you'd have a difficult time. Um, also, if, the, if you'd have to prove a fact different from one trial to another, that also can stop you. It's not something you're going to see a lot of, to be honest. With you. Okay, entrapment. So um, sometimes, I, I would say probably the most common place you would see an entrapment defense is prostitution and assignation. So it was at one time quite common. As I recall, the last big operation in Raleigh was called Operation Phoenix, I think, where they were going after prostitutes to, to charge them not to have sex with them. The entrapment defense uh, is sometimes used. So let's suppose, here, here's your example. Take, take a completely innocent person. You are um, on your way from church, going to work, going to teach Sunday school, and you are stopped by a beautiful member of the opposite sex who says, you're very attractive. Um, if you'll just give me $20, uh, I will have sex with you. You had no intention of doing this at first. Um, you were not predisposed to it, uh, but you were induced into it by this person approaching you. So you agree. And you were then arrested for solicitation of prostitution. And your defense would be, I was entrapped. You had no intent to do it. The government created the crime. Um, that would be a defense. Whether it would work or not, eh, somewhat debatable. It would not be a crime if a private party tried to do that. So if a private person tries to induce you to commit a crime and you agree, not a defense, no entrapment, even if they later turn state evidence. It has to go beyond simple, do you want to? So it has to be aggressive. You, what, some of the most successful ones, defenses of entrapment, is where people feel like that if they don't go along, they themselves are going to be victims of a crime. So if the police masquerading as criminals say, Oh yeah, you're going to go with us in this bank robbery or you're going to get hurt. Well, at a certain point, uh, some juries will say, well, that's the police threatening him and he might reasonably fear for his life, so he might you know, go ahead with this crime. 
Um, still, not a terribly common defense. Uh, of course, there's a number of ways to um, offer defense. One of the big ones is to prove you didn't do it, but somebody else did. And so there's really two types of evidence. There's what is called inculpatory with an I-N. Inculpatory evidence is evidence that tends to show someone committed a crime. But for a defendant, the best type of evidence is called exculpatory. And exculpatory evidence is the best thing to do. So you're accused of killing someone and there's blood found at the scene of the crime that is quite possibly blood and fingerprints is quite possibly the murderers. The blood type is O, your blood type is A. The fingerprints don't match. By providing that exculpatory evidence, you're showing, I didn't do it. Somebody else did it. You're not providing an alibi. You're providing an alternative exculpatory. Okay, the right to a speedy trial. Um, the U.S. Constitution requires that someone accused and charged, not when we're just investigating, they've essentially got to be under arrest, is guaranteed a speedy trial and a public trial. Now, it's a balancing test, and one of the things is um, there is now quite often a long delay between arrest and trial. Some of this delay isn't triggered as a violation of speedy trial because it's really the defense requesting the delay. We need time to prepare. We need to look for witnesses, such and such, such. And some of it is just the inevitability of how crowded our courts are. Um, generally, yes, you have to be brought before a magistrate and informed of your charges. That usually happens under something called the McNabb Mallory Rule within 48 hours. But um, there are very often quite lengthy delays um, to go to trial. So I would say speedy trial is not a very good argument because um, I, uh, I could talk about a number of cases. If, if you want to look at an interesting one, you could look at the um, Jose Padilla case. Uh, you could look it up if you like under Padilla versus Rumsfeld, where someone was taken into custody as a material witness, held for almost two years. And they were getting ready to charge him with conspiracy to blow up a dirty bomb, and then that case fell apart. And they charged him with something else. So, uh, you know, I don't really think speedy trial is a great defense to raise. All right, statute of limitations. Uh, this is a favorite um, thing that you see in crime novels and stuff, if you ever read those, where someone says, well, hey, you can't charge me with that because, you know, it happened 10 years ago. So there are, in many states and in the federal government, um, limits uh, as to how long you can bring charges. You have seen this problem most famously recently with some of the molestation cases uh, where uh, it's very often churches, uh, sometimes the Boy Scouts, where you have people that were sexually molested when they were very young, eight or nine. And sometimes 10 or 15 years have gone by. They now are, are facing that, or sometimes they recall it, having repressed the memory. And... Uh, they want to hold people liable, but the statute of limitations is run. So, you know, one question is, when does the statute start to run? When does when do we start counting the years? Traditionally, you, car you counted from the point at which the crime occurred, not the point at which the crime's reported. Now, this is not a constitutional right, and because of that, and this applies in North Carolina, some states don't have statute of limitations, and some states vary their numbers. North Carolina does not have a statute of limitations. So you could, um, if you had someone that had sexually molested a child 15 years ago in North Carolina, or 20 years ago, and you could prove it occurred, you could charge that person today. Whereas in some states, I believe Pennsylvania has, a, or had, a, uh, a longer statute of limitations of 10 or 15 years you can't bring charges. 
So sometimes you'll hear a state, well, they couldn't bring charges because statute of limitation runs. You won't hear that in North Carolina. Okay, well, that's uh, right around 40 minutes or so. That's about what I like for these. Uh, we'll pick up with Chapter 8 whenever you're ready to listen to it. Have a good night, everybody.